Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's begin. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be navigating product research labels and organ organic versus non-organic choices with Grace DeRocha, who is a registered dietitian nutritionist and spokesperson at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Hi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, I'm very excited to talk to you. And uh, But before we do get started, do you mind introducing yourself in a bit more detail? Yeah, so my name is Grace DeRocha. I have been a registered dietitian nutritionist for ooh, 25 years now. I attended Michigan State University and I live in Michigan. Go green. Um, so I got two bachelor's degrees there, one in dietetics and one in psychology. And then later I went to Wayne State University and got my MBA. So yeah, I've had a plethora of jobs. I'm very passionate about nutrition and helping people live healthier and happier lives. Amazing. And I'm, I'm, I, I wonder why you, you tortured yourself with two BAs. You know, it was funny. The university I went to did not have a minor. You know, some some universities have a major and a minor, and mm -hmm. mine didn't. And I was I was supposed to be a doctor, if you ask my mom. So I, I went in pre-med, and I thought, well, if I do this, maybe I'll be like some kind of psychologist and help people that way. And then I took a nutrition class, and it was over. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am. Okay. Uh, and I'd like to get to know you in a bit more a uh, bit more detail with the section we call Have You Met Grace? Um, so our first thing we'd like to know is what is your favorite book? So, okay. Um, I love this book. Have you ever heard of the book, The Boy, The Mole? Am I going to get it in the wrong order? The Fox and the Horse? No. Okay. So it is, you would think it was a children's book, but it's super deep <laughs> and it's a lot about like self-love and self-worth and self-care and also about being kind and relationships and people you care about um and i love it so every i, I feel like i'm getting like a, a little emotional because every time i read it I, I you weep because it's so it's very simple wording and it's beautiful artistry so the person that wrote it also like it painted it's like part of its watercolor and ink and it's really beautiful and everyone should read it. It's it's super mm -hmm. impactful. My kids love to read it with me and we like cry together. <laughs> um, but it, it's just a beautiful book and it, it kind of like, it is like those small reminders about like what's really most important in life, you know? And I think it sounds like a beautiful book and it also sounds like when the author, you know, loves a book so much that they really go to the effort of like, you know, creating beautiful pictures that maybe they've created themselves, you know, that it was really made with love. Yeah. 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 And it, it is. It's it's beautiful. Mm. You should check it out. <laughs> Thank you. I will. Um, and have you watched any movies recently? Yes. So we just saw the the newest Trolls movie, mm -hmm. Trolls Band Together. It's a cartoon movie. I went with my kids. But I grew up in a time, I'm a little bit older, where boy bands were definitely a thing. And that was definitely the theme. I love myself some in sync, So it was definitely the theme of the movie. And also a, a, a very like deep theme about reuniting and communicating with your family and working through things. So that was also nice to like get to see those messages throughout too. And it's funny, I, the most recent book I just read, I, I just read the Britney book. So <laughs> all my pop pop uh music lifestyle things coming together in the last couple of weeks <laughs> i do find like certainly with my life things tend to um come in themes you know you'll watch a lot of movies about death for some reason <laughs> yes and you're like why is everything about, about my life about death and then you do something else and you're like oh everything's about pop culture and uh music and that's much yeah. better than death yes 
<laughs> Maybe that's just me. No, I feel like pockets of our life like end up being themed for sure, right? Mm. There's like the death ones and there's like the love ones. And now I'm apparently in a pop music theme. <laughs> I think it's definitely a fun one. Yeah, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. And do you listen to any podcasts at the moment? So I go through ebb and flow of a variety of different podcasts. If, if this is funny because sometimes I'm in like a music time, like during my walks or my workouts and the other times I'm in podcast mode. So I have a few. I wrote some of them down. Um, we can do hard things. I don't know if you know that one. Glenn and Doyle and Abby Wombeck. So they are a married couple and they talk about how we can do hard things. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. life isn't always easy. And sometimes we figure out ways to be resilient and we persevere. So I like that. And they're, they're fun. They have a fun banter. Um, Glennon's sister always pops on there too. So that's kind of fun. Um, I also listen to Oprah's Super Soul. I don't, I feel like there's a lot, a lot of them I listen to, like I just cry. <laughs> I think there might be a theme of, I'm an emotional person apparently, but um, what else do I listen to? Sometimes I listen to the um, armchair expert, Dak Shepherds, mm -hmm. which is and a what's fun that about? one. He has different people come on that are sometimes they are actual experts and sometimes they're not and they like pretend like they are <laughs> if you will <laughs> um but Dak Shepard is a comedian you know married to Kristen Bell so he's pretty funny and yeah so it's it just depends sometimes he has celebrities on sometimes he has like his neighbor I mean it just depends on like his mood <laughs> Well, that's now inspired me. Maybe we should get some just random people to come and be experts on this show. Yeah. I don't know if that would track. Maybe for an April Fool's episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and that I, I love your suggestions. They're very, very, I think, on, on brand for this podcast. So thank you for those suggestions. I also, well, I definitely went through a phase of like some crime podcasts like thinking that I was going to solve, like that all of a sudden I was going to be this person that was solving everything in the world and every crime that ever happened. Um, but I had to stop those. I felt like this is getting dark. I don't want to listen anymore. Yeah, I did that too. And then I was like, I actually don't want to know about serial killers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of serial killers, do you have a role model? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that's awesome. I feel like I have a few. I so my mom is one. So actually, how I became a dietitian in the long run, because I said I was supposed to be a doctor, um, according to my, my dad was a doctor, but he passed away when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And he was a surgeon, but he ended up passing away from a stroke secondary to his diabetes. And um, in my mind, I thought I would be a doctor to help people live healthier. I mean, obviously doctors are great, right? But then when I took my first nutrition class, it's kind of stealing the thunder of some of the other conversation we might have. I, and I learned, I didn't even know there was such a such thing as a registered dietitian. And I learned about it and I was like, wow, I, I think I want to do this. I think I want to help people like prevent hopefully chronic conditions and illness and, you know, be healthier and happier and live longer. And mm -hmm. so, so I say my mom because my mom is the rock of our family, right? Because my dad passed when we were young. I'm the oldest. And she, she, she made it happen for us. You know what I mean? Like the day in and day out of momhood and like trying to keep us on track. So definitely her. Um, I feel like my husband is awesome. I feel like the way that he's logical and patient where obviously I've stated I have lots of emotion um, <laughs> is very grounding for me just in like any conversation or like the way he makes me think differently about things is always nice because I always like to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And then my kids, I learn from my kids every day because kids say the darndest things and they are just so observant and so smart and so present that I love that about them. So mm. my family, I guess, are my role models, m models and I get to learn from them every day, which I appreciate. Um, that's amazing. I think that it's it's great that you also get them from so many different perspectives, um, you know, because kids have such interesting new ob observations that are always, they're always learning and you can always learn from them because of that. And then you know, your husband who has quite a different perspective, I guess, you know, in that he's quite, quite grounding. Um, so that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate all of that. It's also good because you can talk to them about your problems. <laughs> exactly. I know. 
Mm. And, My therapist and them. Yes, yes. Um, and um, have you completed any courses that have inspired you? Yeah. So obviously I talked about my first nutrition course, but I think everyone should do this. And I actually looked it up because I think you can sign up regularly. Um, have you ever heard of the Yale, the Science of Wellbeing course? And it's free. I think someone talked told me about this the other week and I was going to sign up and then I forgot. Yeah. Anyway, this is your reminder to sign up. Yeah. Look it. It's like a, yeah. you know, the little ping to be like, I got. Yeah. So it's super interesting. I did it a while ago now, but it was really impactful to just learn how how we operate, how we think of things, and then how we often forget to take care of ourselves, you know? And I I I love to like remember that and tap into that. Probably why my favorite book is that that um that book as well. But it was it, it was it's funny because it's a lot of things that you know that you're reminded of. And then other things that I learned about as far as like how we operate regarding taking care of ourselves and like being in tune with our well-being and figuring out ways to de-stress. So I think that with well-being and also with just things in general, like we know how to do the right thing, but it's remembering to do it and also knowing that it's the right thing to do. Sometimes we're like, I think this might be the right thing, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. So I'm not going to do it. So like having Having a having completed a horse, I think, is just really great because you can be like, this person told me that I should do this and I have to remember to do this. Yeah. And I think too, and I say this about like being a food person, but I say this about recipes and things that you learn. You might learn something one way and like it worked for whatever research study that was. And you take bits of that and you make it your own. You know what I mean? Like a recipe, I think the recipe is a great guidance to like inspire you to like figure out like how you might like something or what would really work best for your life and like as you're navigating your own well-being. Mm, thank you. So um, we like to start off the podcast with some definitions, you know, um, so we know what we're talking about. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to know is how do you define household management? So household management really, it's so broad right? It's the way that you deal with the day in and day out of your home. And this can be everything from like finances to, you know, chores, to the schedule, to who's driving where, to the meal plan, to the extracurriculars and getting your workouts, whatever it might be. But it is a whole gamut of like literally managing your household. And again, that doesn't mean just one or two things. It ends up being everything. Mm -hmm. Who's taking yes. the dog out? Who's cutting the lawn? You know what I mean? Who's cleaning the bathroom? Not it. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, so how, so how does, you know, how does being, you know, being aware of, you know, food labels, nutrition, consumer awareness, how does that, you know, impact household management? What role does that play? Yeah, I love this question. And I kind of, I feel like when I answered the first part of this, I tried not to say that because we're going to dive deeper, but household management and nutrition and meal plan. I mean, I always laugh there in our kitchen. There is a sign that says, um, Alexa, feed the kids. <laughs> because it's like the one thing that you, you have, you do it every day, multiple times a day, like feed ourselves. And sometimes we don't think about it but we should, right? And so when it comes to that awareness of meal planning and digging into reading what we're putting into our bodies to nourish it, it definitely comes into play. And depending on what someone's health goals are and depending on, you know, if, if someone has any kind of chronic condition or illness or food allergy, um, taking a peek at what is in your food is really important. Mm -hmm. So what kind of you know, what kind of things do we need to be looking for? You mentioned, you know, some some health goals or, um, you know, uh, I guess if you've got uh, medical conditions that require you to eat certain things or not eat certain things, um, what, are, what, what do we need to know for those things? Yeah. So I will, can I, I'll start with saying like in general, things that you want to look at are, it's tricky, the ingredient list, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have an allergy or you're trying to avoid something, knowing what is in that, um, sometimes you have to do that and have your phone handy because there's some, you know, different words. Like there's over 50 different words for sugar on a wow. food label. Yeah. So 
for example, right? So like being able to take a peek at that, but then also knowing kind of like where, wh what are you trying to, what is the goal? Like, are you trying to manage your weight? Are you trying to improve your heart health? Um, are you trying to watch how much sugar you're having, you know? And I think a big thing, especially when there's a food label and nutrition facts is looking at the serving size because the serving size dictates what is then written underneath that, right? Mm -hmm. So if the serving, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay. So if you have a can of soup and the serving size is half a cup, but there is a cup and a half in the can of soup, how much of it are you consuming? And then what is that food label? You got to do a little math to kind of I calculate that. And I find it so annoying when it's like 3.2. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that too? Do you really want me to pull out my calculator? Can't we just make it easy math? Yeah. Yeah. Just just make the serving size slightly bigger. I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And so I always say that too. Um, when when you're looking at packaging, even just in general, like the dietitian or scientist didn't write the front of the package where it's like trying to say a lot of different things to sell it to you right um but then the nutrition facts and the ingredients and some of those details of reading the label and and i think too people are pretty cyclic with their food so once you do some of that research and kind of know what's going to work for you what doesn't being able to then know that this is the type of i think oatmeal that I always buy. You know what I mean? Because I know that this is what the serving is. I know that it is like if someone had celiac disease, that this is a gluten-free version, whatever it is that you're kind of trying to aim for as you're looking at those food labels and attain like your different health goals that you're striving for. Mm -hmm. So initially, you know, it sounds like it would take a lot of time initially because you're looking at all the food labels as you're walking around the supermarket. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I tend to be like, duck, 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 duck. And I just put everything into my, um, into my basket and then I'm out of there. Um, but I guess once you know what's, what you're buying and the products that you buy regularly, you don't need to, to look at every single item every time you're there. Yeah. And I, I would say like for people, take the time in the beginning right to do some of the research that you know like if you like a certain food company based on their um i don't know their mission statement you know what i mean or how they do things that could be a great way to then know that that is a company that you like and the, the way they like they make things um and even like knowing that you can also like the world's wide web is a beautiful thing. You don't have to go to the store and stand in the aisle for seven hours. You can look some stuff up online to get a better idea of like, ooh, is it this one or this one? You know? That's true. I do spend a lot of time, you know, weighing up various purchases, you know, clothing, you know, should I buy these okay. leggings or these leggings? Yeah. Why don't I do the same with my cereal? Yeah. And people will, I'm, people don't mess around when it comes to reviewing things and giving their opinion. They'll tell you like, this was supposed to be, you know, the healthier version, but it tasted terrible. So I found this one. <laughs> you know what I mean? They will be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like that. Although I'm very surprised sometimes at what people will review. People will review everything. Yes. And they're yeah. sometimes they're really funny and sometimes they're scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so what are some, like, you know, I guess... Um, challenges that people can come into when they're trying to like re research their food and understand what they're going to be eating? Yeah, I think that sometimes we get stuck in the weeds regarding some things. Um, I call this greenwashing mm -hmm. that like the outside marketer calls something like natural, which doesn't technically have an actual meaning when it comes to whatever is in that. I mean, it could mean a plethora of different things. It could mean nothing, right? Or um, just putting things on the outside that may, or like this will help you blah 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 like this is good for heart health um and and there are some laws around some of that stuff but sometimes there's ways that they can word it to get away with saying certain things that i mean could potentially be true but are not always necessarily true do you know what mm -hmm. i mean um so just being being smarter than the marketer that wrote made the package <laughs> Do you have any examples of 
of like products where maybe they have been a bit misleading or is, I mean too many examples to to count I I definitely the word natural really like hits me hard because I see that all the time and it'll be like this is a natural cereal but then you look at it and then there's like 20 grams of added sugar in it in one piece of it <laughs> do you know what I mean mm-hmm. like yeah um and I'm not a sugar basher. I, I think, yeah. you know, there's added sugar and there's natural sugars, but like things like that where you're like, I don't know. Or or I think when they advertise to kids, that always gets me because it'll be like a cute little cartoon character. And then all of a sudden your children want that and you're like, you don't even like that. But because that was a rainbow haired figure, you're like, I'm in. You know what I mean? And yeah. then <laughs> here we are. But yeah, so I would say that, like some of those things for children and then watching the word natural is a big one or like just extreme claims, right? Mm-hmm. Should be careful of that too. I do, I do it reminds me um, a couple of years ago, so in Australia, we've got this like star health star rating and it's a bit notorious because it's not actually like how good it is for us. It's about how good it is compared to similar products. Um and um, Milo, which is a drink we have, uh, chocolate malt, um, has a very high uh, star rating, or it used to, um, because I, I don't know why it had such a high star rating. Um, and this is a government thing as well, but uh, it was decreased recently quite a lot because there's so much sugar in Milo. Yeah. yeah. It is not good for you. No. Yeah. But they were selling it with, you know, pictures of, um, you know, kids doing sports and sports people um, yeah. saying this is good for kids who want to be active. Yeah. Uh, but it's just sugar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know. It is funny. And like different grocery stores here in the States will have ratings for different food and some do it the right way, like based on actual like nutritional value. Mm-hmm. And then other stores do it a different way. So then as a consumer, that's really tricky if you don't know how they're rating something and why they're doing it. Cause like comparing two things, like comparing a chocolate bar to Milo is different than <laughs> comparing, you know, Milo to water or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so just being, being, I think being an informed and like an educated consumer in your process definitely comes into play. Okay. So when you're wanting to get um, educated and um, know what you're going to be eating, you've mentioned before going online, looking up the nutrition labels, but uh, do you have like any more tips on how to to get started? Because there's just so much food that we eat every single day and it does seem very overwhelming. Yeah. You're going to hate this because it's not sexy and it's, it's, I always say, good nutritional advice is boring (laughs) you know (laughs) um I think there's a lot of little things that can add up to really impactful things like obviously fruits and vegetables and people always think that has to be fresh but it doesn't right like in your frozen aisles actually like picking frozen fruits or vegetables um they usually will harvest those at the peak of ripeness and freeze them. So actually what you're doing is locking a nutritional value that, I'm trying to think of something, like that the butternut squash that is fresh, traveled, got picked, got cleaned, got put into the right bin to go to your grocery store, and then you're getting it three weeks later versus Mm -hmm. I'm only picking butternut squash because I just made butternut squash soup and it's really hard to cut. So (laughs) buying that I made it again and I use the frozen butternut squash and And again, but looking at the label to make sure that it all it was was butternut squash. There was nothing else in it, right? Where sometimes with certain fruits, it'll be like sliced strawberries with added sugar, but it doesn't say that on the front. It just says that in the ingredient list. So again, being taking a little bit of time to take a peek at that. Um, But I think we sometimes get like lost in the weeds of certain food labels and what is advertised and what we see in commercials that we forget like some of the basic things um, to tie in with that. So like the average person only gets about 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day. And we're supposed to get upwards of 25 to 40 grams per day, like Mm. for good gut health to, 
you know, help keep us regular, to be the street sweeper of our system. Fiber helps helps keep us full. It takes longer to digest. I mean, so many things, right? So it makes sense why we would want it. And then what foods are high in fiber? Fruits, veggies, beans, legumes, whole grains. Um, so again, like sometimes when we take a focus of a little thing like that, we actually get to incorporate a lot of other nutritious habits by habit stacking with that that goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So focusing on one aspect of nutrition rather than every single aspect, you know, trying to find the thing that's high in fiber, low sugar, right. medium fat, good fats, <laughs> just saying, just going to up my fiber. And then you actually end up getting all of those things at the same time. Yeah, a lot of times we do. Or, and I think too, focusing on on one thing or smaller goals that we then piggyback on later. You know, I was just working with um, a patient of mine who definitely wants more heart healthy fats and wasn't a big, likes fish, but just like never had it regularly and didn't really know like what, I don't, they didn't know what, what kind to have, like, what am I supposed to have? You know, and with your omega-3 fatty acids that we get from fish, you don't get that from anywhere else. That is, it is something that we need to consume. We can't make it on our own. And so sometimes when people hear those things, they're like, oh, no wonder why. Like you hear that your doctor saying you need to eat more fish, but they don't know why. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like that heart healthy fat from the fish keeps the blood slippery to help avoid, you know, builds up in our arteries and veins. And then they're like, oh. And that's what the HDL, that good cholesterol, that's why we want it to be higher for that reason. So th little things like that. So I gave that person an acronym, SMASH. Have you ever heard of this? No. SMASH is the heart healthy fish fats. So S for, for salmon, mm -hmm. M for mackerel, A for anchovies, S for sardines, and then H for halibut. So those are like five of the really good heart healthy fats that we can get from fish. SMASH. <laughs> smash i like that smash yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever made that joke before yeah right <laughs> so again i think like the piggyback off of what is what are the, some of the small things that i know i need to work on that feel not overwhelming that i can make some small adjustments and keep trying to build upon that and then you start to make that a habit and you like it and you feel better mm -hmm. um and then you're like, what's what's my next goal? I mean, sometimes that could be just water. You know what I mean? Forever trying to drink more water. I know everyone is. And so we've talked a bit about the benefits of, you know, trying to be a bit more healthy. But what, are, what happens if we don't? What are some of the consequences of just eating whatever? Yeah. So it's so funny because I say this um, to people all the time. I feel like I'm a pretty happy person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like... A lot of times with good nutrition, we also, it helps, it can be helpful for our mental health because of the endorphins and the chemicals, like the internal chemicals and hormones that we have that benefit from eating a healthier, more nutritious diet. So even just like that simple nudge towards better nutrition. And then I always tell people, I think it's so important to take the time to do research on yourself and make observations regarding how you are feeling, right? So we've all gone down that road of like not being our most nutritious eating self. I mean, say even as a dietitian, right? Like not making the healthiest choices, like it got busy, I didn't follow our meal plan, we ended up dining out a lot and I was getting whatever, um, and how you feel and tapping into that. Because I will tell you 90, uh, this is my own rough estimate regarding like the patients I've worked with over the years. But I mean, 98 to 99 percent of people, whenever I say that and, they're, and then they just start shaking their head and they're they're smiling and laughing because they, they know. Right. Um, and sometimes I'll have them share a story with me and they're like, you're right. Or like I do notice like someone was just telling me the other day when I eat a banana every day, I don't know why, but I just feel better. And I'm like, OK, we're done. My job here is <laughs> Bye. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but just even like to tap into like some of that and make those observations about ourselves, especially how, with how busy everyone is, um, it's important to note, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think taking those moments becomes kind of a key in how you get to move forward. And it's hard to break some bad habits, you know? Mm. 
Would you say it's, uh, I guess I've got two questions there. Um, would you say that, um, is it is it better to like um, eat maybe one bad thing a day and then have the rest of your diet as good? Or is it, but like, is it also okay to, or is it better just to eat perfectly every day? Oh man, Gabrielle is asking the hard question. So here's the thing. I am like, I think we're all human, right? And I do, I was kind of telling you this earlier. I think food is very important fuel and good nutrition for the body. But mm -hmm. I also think it's it's a lot of things. It is your culture. It is traditions. It is holidays. It is celebrations. It is food is love. Food is family. Food is so many things more than just what we put in that for me to say that someone can't have their favorite thing on their favorite holiday, I would never do that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that be so to answer your question, I think that if we try to make conscious choices to add better nutrition in most of the time, but we and also allow us ourselves some food freedom for our mental health and well being to tie with our nutritional balance for our physical well being, I think you end up in a really good place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Know. And I think we're going to discuss this a little bit later as well. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask too many more questions about <laughs> that. Um, but another question I had was, so you're, you're recommending that we, you know, take note of, you know, what we're eating and how it makes us feel. Because I think that it, I mean, I know that I, um, you know, I have good days and bad days. And then I think I forget uh, what I ate the day before and how it affects me. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend like writing it down or is it just enough to sit and think about it? I think this depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes like people with people that like to track or write it down in, in a journal. Um, a lot of times when I work with people, we kind of talk about what what feels good to them that doesn't feel like another to do on our list of long to do's. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that, like, think about who you are again, right? Think about what works for you to help you get on track or, and maybe it's, maybe you start doing it and then you just do it once a week to tap in. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Or, and sometimes I think too, it's not even just like, it's the food we eat, but maybe like start writing down what time it was that you ate and like, is your timing good? Like, are you getting hangry because you let too much time go? Or did you not drink enough water? Or are you, because you're not drinking enough water and fiber, are you a little bit constipated so you're bloated? You know what I mean? Like talking, talking a little bit more about like those types of feelings too. And then to take a look to be like, oh, you know, observations like we've talked about, like, oh, that's interesting. Like I I noticed on this day, like I was super regular, but I drank more water and it was nice out. So I went for a walk and you know what I mean? And I had stuff to make a salad. I don't know, whatever, where the next day was like super busy. I stayed up too late the night before, so I didn't get my breakfast and then I didn't make the best choices or whatever, you know, so kind of looking at a few things. So one figure out if what observations are most important to you right now. Is it like an app that you can use where you're logging everything because you want to see like your balance of macronutrients? Or is it, oh God, I notice I haven't been drinking enough water and I haven't been pooping. <laughs> so do I need to kind of write down like how to get more fiber and water in throughout the day? Or do I, or the piggyback really is like, do I notice like my sleep patterns are throwing off my eating pattern? Whatever it might be. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I will tell you this. Um, anytime I meet with someone and I ask my open-ended questions for them to think about themselves, they always are smiling because they already know the answer. Do you know what I mean? Like if you take moments of reflection, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I mean, I, I assume a lot of people go to see you for, you know, they've got problems and you're like, do you drink enough water? And they're like, oh, mm, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Or like, how much water did you have yesterday is what I would usually yeah. say. And I think too, it's hard. I just was talking to someone, it's getting, I'm in Michigan um, and it's getting colder here. And so people usually kind of wean off of water because now they they want hot things and so this is a trick that I do I drink hot water with lemon sometimes because I'm cold but I still know I need water and it's kind of like that warm soothing drink without having to be coffee all the time or I love tea too but sometimes just to mix it up a little bit and uh one of my patients she's like 
I have been doing that and I love it. It is my new favorite thing. I did oranges instead of lemon the other day. So it's just like something like you might hear and you're like, oh, when it is cold, I could still have water. It could just be warm. <laughs> I did that for a bit. I would actually just get the zest of an orange and I'd yeah. make like an orange tea. Oh, I love that. Um, another question I have based on that, would you say, so like I I do that um, in winter because it's cold, but I make like tea, like black tea um, or like Chinese tea, jasmine mm-hmm. tea. Yeah. Is that, does that count because there's tea in it? <laughs> this is a great question. So I, uh, and you might not love my answer. So usually, oh, nice. so, no, um, rule of thumb ish, right, is as far as water goes, we want to try to get half of our body weight. So in pounds divided in two in ounces of water or six, you know, a lot of people say 64 ounces of water. You get to count 24 ounces of liquid that you drink that is not water but it can't have caffeine so if you have a caffeine free tea Mm -hmm. and it can't have calories like added sugars okay so like uh decaf tea would work not as fun no i'm just kidding (laughs) um so that or some of um do you guys have like the bubbly like waters like club soda oh like, yeah fizzy water yeah, yeah. fizzy water. oh i love that um so fizzy waters right could count yep. a couple of those like a 12 ounce two 12 ounce cans so yeah and also if you think about it this way 20 percent of our hydration is from food and 80 percent is from um the liquid we actually drink so again dietitian talking about fruits and vegetables super shocking but fruits and vegetables usually carry like 85% and up of water. Mm-hmm. Something I do uh, when it's really hot um, is I just, I have refrigerated watermelon. I just eat the watermelon because I'm like, yes. I cannot, I cannot drink any more water. Yes. Water and watermelon is 97% water, hence the name, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, I mean, cucumbers are like 98% water. There's a lot of different fruits and veggies that are really high up there with the water content that they hold that will help with hydration and electrolyte balancing. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll drink more, have more watermelon and a bit less tea maybe. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And I do have a few questions, I think, um, based on specific products. Um, so like we we're talking before about packaging um, and like a lot of things are, they say they're organic, um, do we, I was waiting for it. I, what is organic? Do we need to think about, do we need to buy organic products over non-organic products? Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote down the definitions. Good. So organic literally means produced or involving production without the use of chemicals. So usually that would be like fertilizers or pesticides, right? Um, or any other artificial agents. So that's what organic means. Non-organic is literally the opposite of that, like using the way we grow our produce, using different fertilizers and pesticides. Here's the tricky thing, and people might not believe me, but a lot of the research that's out there thus far, there are limits regarding what we actually um, goes out into the market for us to purchase from non-organic sources. So if something is labeled certified organic, you'll see that, right, sometimes, that means that they that there is someone went to test and look at how they made or grew, grew or produced whatever it was to be able to say this is certified organic. I will tell you there are companies that do grow things and produce things organically but don't want to pay the fee to have that stamped onto their packaging. Mm-hmm. And then... Even furthermore, things that are non-organic, what we do know is that studies show that the amount of pesticides that were used to make or grow or produce that non-organic product, um, it is minimal amounts of pesticide and residue and low levels that would not necessarily impact your health. I say that with a caveat of it depends on the person though too, right? There are people that are highly sensitive to non-organic things and different pesticides or even have allergies to different fertilizers and pesticides or things that are sprayed onto different things that are made. Um, So again, tapping in to know like how that affects you and how you feel when you're using some of those things. 
So that's what the research shows. But I do, I do think at the end of the day, it's really important to know how you're feeling based on how certain things are made. I do have, I have like a few patients that swear by, if they don't have organic, then they feel terrible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And who am I to say that they don't? So like the fact that they're able to know that about themselves and be able to make those choices to then choose something that is um, certified organic for them is important, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have other people who are like, I don't feel, I, I don't get why it's such a big deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, why are people so up in arms? <laughs> so would you say it's more about how you're feeling when you you have the product um, as opposed to you have to have organic or organic is a scam. It's just like if you feel better when you're eating organic, then eat organic. If you don't feel any difference, then do whatever. Yeah. And I do think too, like doing like our own due diligence about certain things, like making sure we wash things, some, you know, like thoroughly just in general. Right. I mean, like a lot of times fertilizer is, is part of that is some kind of like feces <laughs> to help things grow and so just being smart about washing things um, mm -hmm. as we're going through the process I will tell you that research also shows that as far as nutrient value like uh, like carrots with their, the vitamin a content in something that's organic versus non-organic it's the same okay so if you if you can't afford non-organic uh oh, sorry if you can't afford organic and you don't right. feel any difference just go ahead and buy the normal carrots yeah and i think that's such a good point because it that is not lost on me with like food deserts or you know we so freely talk about the privilege that a lot of people might have to be able to buy whatever but that's not always the case for every single person right mm -hmm. so being able to know that you still are having a carrot that is good for you and has nutritional value, whether it be organic or non-organic is important. Um, and you can buy the frozen one too, <laughs> you know, or whatever is available to you that makes sense for your budget and what works like with your lifestyle. Hmm. Yes, I think that's really important. Um, and another question I have um, with is GMO. So that's genetically modified, right? Okay. Do we need to watch out about that? Because I see a lot of products, they say no GMO. And I'm like, I don't know about yes. that. Yeah, this is a great question. So um, a fast answer would be, again, it depends on the person, but GMO, most things are genetically modified. Is that fair to say? You know what I mean? Like, um, do you buy seedless watermelon ever? Uh, or do you try it? I buy the watermelon that is in the supermarket. Yeah, me too. I buy what's on sale. Yeah, exactly. And most of the times those are see all seedless now because it's easier for the farmer also to produce because that's what is available. Um, so that's genetically modified. You know what I mean? So a lot of times there are, so there's a variety of studies showing that GMO foods are safe. There are some studies saying, you know, when we think about, um, hormones and chemicals and things like that, that some people have to be careful more than others, right? Like if you have a weakened immune system, if you have like just being, you know, those things can play potentially, but in general, GMOs are fine. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I've heard people say to me, well, I never eat strawberries because it's on the dirty list. And I'm like, I would rather have you eat the strawberry than, you know, and wash it and than not have a strawberry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, as a dietitian that really advocates for healthy eating and good nutrition, I, I'm i open to learning more always and like seeing what the latest research shows and things like that. But I also don't want people to feel um, fear or like get fear mongered regarding like, well, that's not organic or that's, that's GMO. I will never have watermelon that's seedless or grapes that are seedless or and science can be a beautiful thing <laughs> you know at the same time like to help us in the long run so mm -hmm. you know again tapping into you tapping into what your beliefs are and how you feel when you eat certain things comes into play here as well 
Okay, thank you. Um, and was there anything that you wanted to, dis to discuss that we've missed out on talking about? No, I, I, I think like, just to reiterate, I think for people, I think it's really important to figure out what your health goals are. You know, we have things that we have uncontrollable risk factors. So if you're healthy and you feel good, but maybe like dig in to see like, do you have family history of certain chronic conditions to be aware of for the future, right? Like things we can't control, your family history, your genetics, your age, your gender, things like that, right? Um, but then also there are so many things on the controllable side that we do get to like empower ourselves with knowledge and effort and changing habits or, you know, piggybacking off of those habits that may already be good. Um, you know, what we eat, when we eat, how much we're having, what we drink, when we drink, how much we're drinking. Um, are we sleeping? Are we avoiding drugs? Um, are we trying to do things like to exercise and de-stress? So I feel like I just named off 12 things where like the uncontrollable risk factor list is shorter. Um, so just reminding ourselves, because sometimes I think people get stuck in that too. Like, well, I have bad genes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. And then just giving up, but reminding ourselves that we do have some power over what we do and how we live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I know in my future um, that I probably, I have family history of diabetes and I'm like, I need to keep an eye on that. Um, make sure that nothing happens. And that's an uncontrollable risk, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's quite likely, but if I, I guess, control some of the controllable things, maybe it won't develop, but if it does, you know what, it, it was probably always going to happen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, I know, well, same for me, right. That's definitely part of the genetics. And, and like, that's my joke is like, my dad was a type one, my mom's a type two. I had gestational diabetes when I was pregnant. So I'm just waiting. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's why I do what I do to like help, help people prevent some of these things. Or even if it does happen to know what you should do to like have the best quality of life, even if you are having to manage something like that. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, and we're going to move on to the practices and habits because I think that does kind of tie into what we've just talked about. Um, so what is the practice that you do when purchasing food? So a few things, like even before purchasing food, um, I try to take inventory of what we have at home because I don't like to waste. Um, and we do always, well, when it's warm, we have a garden, right? So we try to definitely have that come into play. And then looking at what we have and what can we piggyback off of that to then develop a meal plan. Um, I'm like a little nerdy and cheesy, but I like, I like to name my days too. So sometimes Monday is like a meatless Monday or a Mediterranean Monday. Tacos are Taco Tuesday, but not always traditional. Like I just made like a Asian taco the other day, you know, like playing with flavor profiles. Um, Wednesday, I like this to be like kid inspired. So I tell my kids that they have kids cook Wednesday. And sometimes it's, they're a little bit younger still, like nine and 11, but they will like make good food. <laughs> and I'm like, I think it's important for them to like get in the kitchen and do some of that. Um, with my son, especially too, my daughter, both of them. And leftover Thursday, pizza Friday, and whether that be we're making it or getting some, but playing with like naming days to help inspire things. And it changes too. It's not always that perfect. Um, and then making a grocery list based on that. I find sometimes if I don't have a grocery list, I'm like, Duh, like <laughs> wandering aimlessly and, or just putting everything in the cart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I like to do that. And then in general, you'll like this one. We do this as a family and I do this more for my husband because it took him a while to understand he was married to a dietitian. But we do like try, we try to eat the, a rain, eat the rainbow every day. And I'm not talking about like Skittles, um, but like having a variety of fruits and vegetables every day mm -hmm. to try to get all the different colors in. One, when our kids were younger, it was really fun for them. And then two, it trained my husband to understand he had to try some new things. And three, it was a little bit of a challenge sometimes. 
So my husband would do that all the time. He would call me and be like, did you have anything purple or blue today? And I was like, no, because someone took all the blueberries and blackberries. I don't know who it was because he thought he was funny by doing that. But again, so we we had fun with it and we still try to do that um, now. And I think eating seasonally comes into play there as well. Like what's in season during this time, like this fall, winter time for us um, and what's available. So those are a few things that we do. We do water challenges in our house too. I feel like when I was a kid, me and my husband talk about this all the time. You know how kids nowadays, they always have water bottles. I don't, mm-hmm. I think as a child that I just not ever drink water because we would drink it out of the drinking fountain, which I don't know. Yeah. Hashtag illness and germs all the time. But um I like I never like carried a water like when I play when I, I would I would go to dance class. like I don't remember having water do you know what I mean so now I we always talk about like do we get enough water because our kids are so good like filling up their water bottles and I'm like did I did I get enough water so like doing like little challenges for ourselves too like that to try to focus on like those little things that we know that we have to work on when it comes to practicing good nutrition um when it comes to what? reading Oh, sorry. Sorry. What is the water bottle or what is the water challenge? Like, is it like drink so many cups of water in a day? Or... Yeah. So sometimes it'll be depending on the person. So for me, sometimes I <laughs> laugh at me. I will set like little, you know, I said water nudge earlier. I put little alarms on my phone to like water nudge me, especially like during a busy work day um, to make sure like I drink so much so that I'm drinking throughout the day. Um, my kids are so good. My husband will just really drink a lot at once. Like he'll drink like a whole, you know, 16 ounces in one shebang and then not drink again for like two and a half hours and be like, oh, I got to drink, you know. So just depending on how the person operates, I'm better like little spurts at a time. The good thing, like when you do drink a lot of water, then you get more steps in because you're always going to the bathroom. So that's what I find annoying. I'm I'm definitely more like your husband. I will forget to drink all day and then I'll sit down for dinner. I'll drink like three glasses of water. I'm like, oh, I'm so thirsty. Why am I so thirsty? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, depending on the person, I do it in smaller spurts, but he will be like you. And mm-hmm. just Gabriella and Tom are just going to drink all the water at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I drink my water like I water my plants. I suddenly remember to do it after five days. I know. I pretend. I feel like my plant back there is growing pretty good. I feel like I pretend I'm like a good plant mommy, but I feel like the we can learn a lot from plants. They stay grounded. They love nature. They like their water and they like their sunshine. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I want to be a plant. Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your uh, practices. Um, I'm going to finish this podcast. I'm going to drink all my bottle of water in one go. <laughs> Perfect. We do have some time as well today for our audience questions. Um, so uh, our first question is, um, how can consumers effectively navigate product research to make informed choices when shopping for everyday items? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think it comes back to, we have the World Wide Web where you can tap into things. What I would tell people to be careful of is when you're looking things up online, um, look at your sources, like look for reputable sources and real research studies, like usually through universities as opposed to, and, and nothing against like um, different companies doing their own research on their products, but there's a little bit of bias there sometimes too, right? Um, so I think that comes into play is like tapping in and doing some of that research. Again, knowing your health goals so that you know what you're actually looking for you know, what is the goal? If you are trying to watch added sugars and you know, and you've heard like, oh, a lot of yogurts have a lot of added sugar. Like what could I do instead? And sometimes thinking outside of the box, maybe it's not a certain brand that has less added sugar, but maybe you go down the route of having Greek yogurt, which doesn't have any added sugar. And then you add fruit for some natural sweetness. You know what I mean? So like Mm -hmm. looking at products, and doing that research and thinking, oh, okay, there's a couple options that I have here. Um, but w- w- what it, what else could I do potentially mm-hmm. to still 
have my yogurt and some sweetness too. Hmm. Thank you. And um, our second question is, uh, what are the key considerations when reading product labels and how can individuals dec decode complex ingredient lists? Yeah, this is a good question. And we talked about it a little bit. So the first mm -hmm. thing, serving size is definitely important. And so I didn't really go through the list like I'm about to now. I think if there is history of high blood pressure or you already have high blood pressure, looking at the sodium is really a key. In general, for general good health, 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day is the, is the limit or the where we should be. Um, if you have high blood pressure or you're battling high blood pressure or hypertension, uh, 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day is a key. So what we know to piggyback off of that particular thing is that a lot of times when something's processed, not only do they add the sodium as flavor, but also as a preservative and additive. So just noting some of those things that might be a part of your diet. And anytime you can control it and be in the driver's seat, try to do that. You're not going to like this. Um, one teaspoon, <laughs> people hate when I say this, one flat teaspoon of table salt already has 2,300 milligrams of sodium. I know. No. I know. I know. So I, <laughs> I think that that cancels up my next question, which is, uh, based on this, which is, um, so if you're tr like, I try to eat less processed food, knowing that it's got a lot of additives in it, you know, that I, I want to control what I'm going to eat. And because of that, I'm like, okay, if I want to make roast broccoli, um, because I'm making a fresh food, um, and not eating processed foods, I can put as much olive oil and salt on it as I want. <laughs> so, you know, you know, I love this. It depends, right? If you know that you don't have hypertension and like mm -hmm. sometimes um, like athletes need more sodium to help replenish that electrolyte balance in their system, right? And olive oil is a heart healthier fat, right? We know that it is a great choice. But again, even too much of a good thing can can kick up the fat content and calories that you're consuming. Oh, I do love olive oil and salt and roasted broccoli. Yeah. So just, and I think too, that comes with like, as you're experimenting and playing with your recipes, like what, where do I like it? What is my minimum amount? And then can I be somewhere in the middle? You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. And I will say that sometimes my partner does put too much olive oil in it and then it's too greasy. So I'm yes. like, okay, I got to actually dial it down a bit. Yeah, it's, it reminds me, I always talk about this like as Goldilocks and the Three Bears when I'm talking to patients about different things that they love. Like, you know, is it too much? Is it too little? And it, Or is it just right? And where can we find that just right to meet your health goals? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you for, for all these tips. Or was there anything else that you wanted to say about, um, you know, declading um, ingredient lists? Yeah, well, so I was going to say, so, right, we talked about sodium. A lot of times now, which is a nice add-in with um, some of the nutrition labels, is they added a line with added sugar. So you have your carbs, you have your sugar, and so now there's a, some things have a line that says added sugar. So just being careful of how much added sugar is in something. And like I mentioned earlier, there's over 50 different names for sugar. If it ends in an OSC, it's probably <laughs> some kind of sugar or sugar alcohol you know, if it sounds like something that has ethanol, but before it, it's like glucoethanol that, you know, just being careful of what that added sugar amount is. And then also being careful of the saturated fat amount in regards to heart health and cholesterol numbers. With the sugar, I would have assumed that just any sugar would be bad and like, it doesn't matter if it's added or not. Does it, does that make a huge difference? Well, yeah, because an apple has natural fructose, right? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't ever say an apple was bad. But then if you're having apple cake, <laughs> 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 so you have like, you know, in the baked goods section, an apple fritter, or apple donut or something, you know, where it has mm -hmm. apples, but then they've also obviously added sugar because it's now a dessert. Um, I think 
being having an understanding of where is the sweetness coming from you know it's kind of like that yogurt discussion like wow this yogurt brand tastes really great and it has fruit in it you know pre-packaged but then the added sugar line like whoa that's you know because dairy has natural sugar as well lactose um mm -hmm. so you know just being aware of some of the things that are naturally in something right so you're Greek yogurt will have a little bit of lactose, so it'll say that there's some sugar, but you know it's natural if you're getting one that's not sweetened. And then again, you can add your fruit in to piggyback off of how sweet you want it with some natural sugar. And the way that we digest and use some of that, um, a lot of times our natural sugars are also piggybacked from a nutrient-dense food like fruit, right? Okay. Like a sweet potato. So you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck with nutrition and fiber versus sugar granulated. Okay. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you uh, have any more questions or, no, let me start that again. Um, and uh, for, if you're listening today and you want, you have lots more questions um, for our future guests, uh, keep an eye on our Instagram on Tuesdays uh, because we are now collecting uh, audience questions on Tuesdays. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we'll move on to the open mic. So this is where you get to talk about something that you're passionate about um, and it can be related to our topic, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and uh, what would you like to talk about today? So as a registered dietitian nutritionist, I think I, I, I think food is like its own love language. I know I grew up that way, right? And so food a lot of times in this day and age is just considered fuel or calories and with social media and aesthetics and wanting to look a certain way, a lot of times for a lot of people, we forget like how that ties into our well being, like enjoying a meal with people that we love and breaking bread together and having that time together. Cause food is so much, right? It's, it can be cultural, food is traditions, food is family, food is friends, food is celebrations, food is love. So I, I would love to remind people of that too, like as they're going in with, in their day to day, um, that food is so important for us, like to nourish us, but it also part of it like nourishes our soul. So if there are things that you do love, you can find ways to incorporate them that make sense to still piggyback off you living your healthiest lifestyle. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So, um, for example, like my mom, she, um, she was pre-diabetic, so she had to really cut down her sugar and just her general, um, the types of food she was eating. And I think we were saying, mom, you know, it's our birthday. We still want you to have a bit of cake because it's a birthday party. Um, and that's okay. You're saying that that's fine. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely, yeah. Who, who are we to ever say that someone on their birthday can't have birthday cake? Do you know what I mean? And I think too, in our lives, we're always trying to find balance. So if you know that you're having your birthday cake later, maybe don't have, this is me and my mom's conversation. Mom, don't have like 15 cups of rice. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but like, you know, like let's get back on the rice so you can have your ube cake. You know what I mean? Like yeah, without having to feel guilt or feel bad and still get to enjoy all the things that you like. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess it's your birthday, but you shouldn't eat the 15 cups of rice and also the cake. Right. Yes. Don't, you don't have to do both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and if our listeners want to find out more about you, your work, um, where can they find you? Yeah. So they can definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, under Grace DeRosha, find me. I would love to hear from you and connect with you. My Instagram is also at Grace DeRosha, so you can find me there. And if anyone has like real questions that they want to keep private, you can email me at GraceDeRoshaNutrition at gmail.com. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure that um, those links are in our show notes so you can find them. And you also said that you would um, provide the links for some of the studies that you quoted, and they'll also be in our... Um, uh, in our show notes today. So thank you so much and check those out if you are interested. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so thank you for joining me today. A very interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to be thinking about cake for the rest of the day, unfortunately. Same. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed every moment that we had together today. 
Thank you so much. You've been listening to On The House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.